If life's a mystery, who done it? Welcome to Ye Gods, Ye Gods and Goddesses. I'm Scott Carter. Today we'll hear part two of my conversation with my friend, Emmy-winning TV writer-director Michael Patrick King, executive producer of Two Broke Girls, The Comeback, and the Sex and the City series, movies, and current sequel, and just like that. Last week we heard about Michael's Catholic upbringing, the spiritual journey to his personal truth, and coming out as a gay man. Today we'll hear how meditation and other practices Keep him centered in gratitude. Enjoy. Where would you say you are now spiritually? Would you describe yourself as a Catholic? I would describe myself as a a Catholic church, an empty Catholic church. I have the structure, but I am not the dogma. I am not the priest. I am not the belief system. I am the building. I am the form, but I'm not the substance, and I am very spiritual. But but over a period of time, you have built up practices and beliefs for yourself. When did that start? Eventually, it started to become the religion of me. Who am I? Was the religion I, how do I become me that I know? How do I do that? And I'm very, very weak. I don't know how to do that. I need a lot of help. And I never thought about the Catholic Church as giving me help in terms of coming out. Like there was, or, or acknowledge, there was no path there. There was no Jesuit rule about, hey, we'll help you. So I sort of abandoned that idea and that thinking when I realized I needed help. And it's always very sly the way it starts. You don't even know. I mean, you're, Scott, you're a big person in my life in terms of you have said things to me that have opened up other things in terms of thinking and thoughts and important spiritual thoughts. And I had a theater and you did your show there. And I still, to this day, when people ask me if I believe in God or an afterlife, I always quote your line from Heavy Breathing, your one-man show, where you say that you, and I'm going to misquote you, but that'll be, the essence will be true. That heaven or the afterlife, you will liken it to an ant walking along the ground at the Astrodome. There's an entire elaborate structure above them that they have, the ant has no understanding even exists. They're just trying to get across the AstroTurf. And I often think about that when I think about what, is after life. I often think of your astrodome like I'm an ant and there's this thing that I have no awareness because I'm looking down here and I'm earthbound. So you've been a big part of my sort of spiritual thinking about a lot of stuff. But it started at the improv in the kitchen. One of the waitresses there was named Alex Summer and she was cool and she was like a hippie waitress. And one day she was always reading And I wasn't a reader at that point. And she was reading a Doris Lessing book. I said, what are you reading? And she was like, read this. And so I read this Doris Lessing book. I don't remember what it was, but it was the beginning of that sort of sci-fi thinking, like, oh, there's another way of looking at stuff. It's almost quantum-y. And then she started talking about these books called The Journal of Cron, Marriages Between uh, the Zones 3, 4, and 5. And in theory... They're science fiction, but in reality, they're not. They're about spiritual uh, structures that are outside of the earth plane. And I started reading those and I was like, what's happening? What do you mean that there's another consciousness somewhere here? And I started reading them. And then that sort of led to reading like Shirley MacLaine's book about, you know, her past lives. And that was so entertaining because it was like show business and spirituality And I had once seen her in terms of endearment and was crying hysterically. And I thought, there's a connection here. This is beyond me looking at a movie actor. There's something I need to figure out. Anyway, so Alex became my sort of shaman. And we started doing everything. I would go to psychics. At one point when I went to LA, she had moved to LA. And we would go to a house in San Fernando Valley in the summer. And we'd go into this basically track house and you would bring a, you had to bring a bottle of water that they were going to bless. And you would sit in this person's living room and they would have four massage tables and you couldn't speak. 
and they would come over to you if you needed spiritual cleaning. They would take your hand to the table and clean you. And I remember thinking, are they going to clean me? Am I going to get... And one time I got cleaned and Cheryl didn't. And we had to justify that on the way home. Like, I guess I needed it and you're further along. But like, you know, sweat lodges. But the, the drumbeat, the drumbeat, the drumbeat was all me facing me. Me facing me. And eventually at one point in New York, when I was in my little hot studio apartment, I would chant this indigenous person chant where they encourage you to see a lotus explode. And then I would put myself in the lotus and, but like at like 11 o'clock in the morning on my floor with a cassette tape, like I have got to get to the lotus. I've got to see the other part of me. It was aggressive exploration because I knew that on the other side, there had to be self-acceptance. There had to be. And I had to get there and I felt the way was through meditation and then through the most powerful tool was Shotki Gawain's book, Creative Visualizations, because that sort of was everything to me. And it was about looking at how you're programmed and rerouting the programming by actually saying affirmations. And when I was in New York, my main thought was, I'm broke, I'm broke, I'm broke. It would go through my mind every minute of the day. I'm broke. I'm not successful. I'm broke. And what this did, it broke literally my patterning. And I started to say, not I'm rich because they don't encourage you to be specific. She would encourage you to say infinite riches are now freely flowing into my life. So that was what I began to do. And I still, to this day, every night for 25 minutes, do my ritual before I go to sleep, which is cleaning out, aligning, same prayers, only they're, they're two, the best version of what I need to be, not to any specific saint. And I do that rigorously because I think it is a way of continually staying in focus, but it's not about somebody outside of me anymore, even though I do think there's an Astrodome out there. I do think there is a connection to something bigger I do believe still in the non-randomness of stuff. I don't really like the idea of randomness. I don't like it. I like the idea, I mean, I'm a writer. I don't like bad news, so I turn it into a good story. Like, even my mother's death, I had to turn into a story about the eulogy. Like, I don't want to be set with randomness, that anything bad can happen. <clears throat> so I still have an anchor in trying to believe that there is a course curriculum that you've set up for yourself to grow. And that's what I think right now. So do you, would you say that you believe in God? Yes. Do you believe that when we die, our actions on earth are evaluated or judged in some way? I think that was the main nuclear fuel for a lot of my growth as to where I am now. Now I think I don't begin to imagine a judgment as much as an acknowledgement. I wouldn't think I'm going to be judged for what I didn't do. If there is a higher school, I would think I would be acknowledged. I would hate to think that judgment is part of a higher consciousness as much as an acknowledgement would be. Because the judgment feels Catholic to me. Does the devil come to your shoulder anymore? It is no longer... The devil, he's not a red devil. It might be a green envy. I might see the devil as envy or a part of me that's less secure. I think that there's a, a part, you know, that whole thing about you are the God, you are the everything. I'm, I, don't think I'm, I don't think I'm haunted by evil or, or there's anyone forcing me. There's no one with a pitchfork. I mean, if there's anyone with a pitchfork, it's me. Michael, in all these years that we've been talking about, which go back decades now, has there, is there any one quote that in times of stress you find yourself returning to you that provides comfort to you? Yeah, and it's, it's one of my affirmations, and it, it really quieted me. And the quote is, I am always in the right place at the right time, successfully engaged in the right activity. It really stops my judgment 
of what's happening and where I am. And it's something I have to remind myself all the time. I guess it's be here now would be the, would be the sixties version of it, but without any judgment, but I need someone to tell me it's all exactly as it's supposed to be. Or it's a version of being neutral. <laughs> ah, and that's why you have a podcast. That kind of <laughs> conscious thought, just waiting to turn it around. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting because when I wasn't neutral, I wasn't believing I was in the right place at the right time, successfully engaged in the right activity. I was in the right place with the wrong people, not being heard and recognized. So the journey of life, I mean, and trust me, Scott, I know that you've done a lot of work and I've done a lot of work to get to the point where we actually have careers that are still interesting and active and that everybody doesn't get this. Enormous people don't get the opportunity to still do what they believed they should at the Brill Building. When we were on fire, like we are going to turn television on and I'm just so thankful that there was enough drive or passion, or I would even say blessed dysfunction that you needed to get recognized. I mean, I guess if you recognized yourself, you wouldn't drive so hard to be recognized by others. But I, I really feel that everything is, you know, I'm really happy to have been raised with such a potent dogma and such a ritualistic church because I don't feel a slave to it. I feel that I'm above, I'm over it. I was going to say above it, but I have an overview of it uh, that is a little bit comic and a little bit respectful. So I'm really happy that we get to be at a place now where we were, we were understanding that we weren't neutral and now we can sort of be neutral or not, depending on how we we're in charge of it rather than it's in charge of us. You were one of the original thinkers. So whew, I'm thrilled to have gotten to do this. Oh, another way of looking at the drive is it may be correct that the same issues within you that were bedeviling you for, for decades until you got them out and worked with them, you, you made them into a present for the world. And, you know. and the drive isn't necessarily a negative thing. It's, it's a world gift, and that's a positive thing. You know, I always say to people who are starting out, uh, you know, I started when I was in New York at 19 thinking I was going to be something. And at 38, I still didn't have my rent. So the only difference between, and, and that's a lot of years without anyone saying, you've got it. I mean, there's a drive that is un founded in some people that's about feeling something inside that needs to get out. And it's not about how it gets out. I started out thinking I was going to be in movies being so young and introducing, you know, that he's so young, we, we introduced him. Uh, and instead it became about writing and, and, and directing and everything. But there's an unspoken drive to be, to get something out. You have something that needs to be seen, whether that be yourself or in my case, myself and another couple of thoughts for everybody else. If you don't have a drive underneath it all, for better and for worse, I don't know if you'll make it. Um, let me just, I'm going to make one concluding comment and you, uh, and then I want to ask you one last question. The mm -hmm. concluding comment is you've mentioned this apartment that your parents uh, came to in New York. I was in that apartment. You went down steps Mm -hmm. into a tiny place. Mm -hmm. And there was one giant thing in that place, which was a portrait of Van Gogh. That's right. And, and I remember years later, after all of your success, coming to a party at your house and seeing that picture was still there, but now it had manifested this great, beautiful house around it. Whereas mm -hmm. at one point, that was the only thing. And now it's, it's something that manifested a lot else. And now it's in my office at, at Warner Brothers. That painting, first of all, the apartment that you came to, I 
renamed the doorway to hell because you had to go down into it and people would pee in front of it. So it was hell and it was hot. So it's hell, devil, all the same thing. But that painting of Van Gogh was done for a play I did, I wrote and was in called Van Gogh Passion about an unrealized artist who couldn't pay his rent that I did with my friend Dan Bunnell. And what happened in the play was it started with a Van Gogh and then people painted over it. So at the end of the play, it was a blank canvas. So you're like, okay, you take somebody else's art and you make it a blank canvas and start on your own. But the thing was, it had to be painted over every night. And we didn't have, it was on wood. And they said, we don't know how to can do it. I said, I can do the painting. I'll paint it. I'll paint it. They're like, can you do that? I said, I have to, we have to do it. So I was in this big loft and I was painting. I had the grid of the Van Gogh, pas- the Van Gogh self-portrait and we had heightened all the colors. So the green was more chartreuse and the orange was more vibrant, but I was painting it and painting it and painting it. And I got to them and it was going well and I'm not a painter, but it was, I was doing it and I got to a middle and I was about to do the nose and I started to have an anxiety attack that I was going to ruin it. And I, and I was like, Dan, I feel like I'm freaking, I don't think I can do this. And Dan said to me, walk to the other end of the loft. And I said, what? He said, put down the paintbrush and walk to the other end of the loft. And I walked to the other end of the loft and I saw that it, all I had to do was correct one part. And he said, yeah, you're lost in the painting. So I got a distance from it and was able to go back and do it. So that painting to me means an enormous amount about getting lost in something and not having any perspective. And when I moved from the doorway to hell to LA, the only thing I cared about that I moved was that Van Gogh painting. And it's wood, it's painted on wood because it had to be washed every night. And I thought to myself, even if this shows up broken, because it was sent by a moving company, I will hang it in two pieces. And that'll be the new story. But it didn't. And now it's still hanging over my desk. The last question is, if you could have everybody in the world experience one work of art, experience maybe traveling to someplace, one thing that was maybe life-changing for you that you think might be transformative to others, what would it be? I had an experience in the Vatican, no surprise there, when I saw the Pieta. I was with my friend Alex, who I told you about, who has since passed on who was the sort of spiritual guide. And her son had committed suicide when he was a teen. And we were on tour in Europe and we went to the Vatican and we were standing across in the Pieta and she collapsed because it was a mother holding a son. And it was a very big moment and it sort of seared into my mind what art can do. And aside from the fact that it's white marble and you feel as though you're seeing blue veins underneath those two figures, Mary specifically and Jesus, the fact that that beautiful sculpture brought up a buried feeling that maybe she was now able to release showed to me the power of what art can be hundreds of years after it was finished that a human being sees something in that sculpture that opens up that portal of shared sadness with those two people, the mother of Jesus and the mother of my friend's son, that I was like, wow, art is really about transitioning people out of where they are to someplace they need to be. So the Pieta, when you look at it, is exquisite. But when you think about it, it's one story that really reflects all the mothers in the entire world who have lost their sons or their children or something. It's a very personal story that is huge. So if I had to pick one thing, it's only to illustrate that art can actualize emotion hundreds of years later in somebody unsuspecting. It came out of nowhere. Michael Patrick King, you have been a blessing to my Uh life. I'm so delighted that we continue to know each other and nourish each other and inspire each other. Let's have dinner sometime soon in LA. I mean, this podcast is kind of like one of our dinners, but without the check. 
You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> oh, there, oh, there will be a check. <laughs> check. Okay, great. I'll gladly pay it. It was a delicious meal. Thank you. My conversation with Michael reminded me of all of the artists I've known or read about who, in pursuing their craft, also worked to achieve a spiritual balance in their lives. When I heard that actor Alan Arkin had died at the age of 89 on June 29, 2023, I didn't binge any of his films, though I've enjoyed many, especially Glen Gary Glen Ross, Argo, Hearts of the West, and Little Miss Sunshine, for which he won an Oscar. Instead, I went to one of my bookshelves, and I pulled out his spiritual memoir, Halfway Through the Door, An Actor's Journey Toward the Self, which he wrote in 1977 when he was 43 years old. I'd read it in 1987 after a near-death asthma attack had put me in the hospital for a week and jump-started the spiritual journey that I've been on ever since. Halfway Through the Door was less a celebrity memoir than an epic therapy transcript. Young Alan was a gifted neurotic boy who sought escape in art, but when he became a Tony-winning Broadway star, it all went stale for him. He treaded water in analysis until he met a guru named John who taught him meditation, which led to many experiences, including energy healing, hallucinations, out-of-body episodes, and past life regressions. Despite his progress, Arkham was still plagued by paranoia and periodic rages, including a time when he felt his father was rooting against him in a family tennis match, so he threatened to kill his dad with a rocket. The book concludes the changes that have taken place within me as a result of my grudging acceptance of Guru's words, have been so profound that I have no choice but to continue following his instructions to the best of my ability, knowing that my life has been given unity, direction, and continuity by his teachings, and that each leap of faith I have taken into his arms has increased my wingspan, which seems to be his greatest source of joy. When my younger self read this book, I saw it as a possible catalog of future adventures that might be mine if I continued on this artistic and spiritual path. But in rereading it recently, I thought, well, I've meditated on and off for about 40 years and once took a past life regression workshop. But otherwise, most of what Arkin called his otherworldly experiences have not been mine, nor have I ever fallen under the spell of a guru. Then I found on Audible, that Arkin wrote in 2018 a book called Out of My Mind, Not Quite a Memoir, which revised and expanded on Halfway Through the Door. Toward the end of it, he wrote, My devotion to Guru John's teachings became virtually ironclad, but, but just a few pages later, he wrote, Somewhere in the middle of the third decade of my connection with John, I began feeling that things were not progressing in ways that were making sense. Shortly after, Arkin withdrew from John's ashram, and then he says, the entire community collapsed, taking John and almost everyone else with it down. And then, when I wanted more details, Arkin got vague, so I went to the internet and I found online a 2020 Guardian interview with Arkin that identified his guru as John Batista, who, in 1993, was charged with putting three women and a teenage girl in a trance-like state and sexually molesting them. Arkin told The Guardian that after John's suicide, he hid in his own room for months and even considered taking his own life, but found himself saying, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but then he admits he couldn't work out what was the baby and what was the bathwater. I went back to the audiobook, which ended with Arkin's measured, weary, 86-year-old voice, describing his final years as quiet and private and peaceful. Maybe he separated, at last, the baby from the bathwater. Maybe he didn't. I try to avoid judging, but I can't help seeing other people's lives as either cautionary or inspirational models. I believe Alan Ark was a great artist, who I think tried to slay his demons to become a good man, by walking down a devotional path that I myself would avoid. In any case, he's now no longer halfway through the door. And the door that's closed behind him is one that you and I 
must also someday pass through. And between now and then, may we all be fortunate in our choices. So that's our show. If you've ever regretted a spiritual choice, email us at yegodspodcast at gmail.com or contact us on social media at yegodspodcast or rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And until next time, be of good cheer.